So the one thing that I want to do right now is sort of walk you through the articles and make sure that you understand what it is that you need to focus on and what's a little bit superfluous. So for instance, Teresa de Loretta's writing is, um, can be incredibly theoretical and your condo writing as well had a lot of like existentialist theoretical themes. So we wanna make sure that you don't get too caught up in that um, and that you're able to, to sort of walk through and look at the major argument that's being made. So I wanna point out um, one thing going into the Delaretta's piece, uh, which was written in 1999. So I want you to think very critically about gender nonconforming and trans bodies um, and Cronenberg's film and the language that was not yet used, um, much less sort of popularized. Um, in the late 90s. Uh, Della Redis is coming from a very particular sort of psychological um, feminist approach. And she's really reliant on Freud, who himself is also really reliant on gender binaries. So I want us to make sure that when you're reading this, that you're thinking of this as something that's happening in that moment. And, that, and understanding that you're very careful not to visit sort of violence through your language in the way that we talk about gender nonconformity um, and trans folks. Uh, this is a little bit extra and is certainly superfluous to the reading, but I want to make sure that you know this because I feel like it would be remiss if I didn't point out these language issues and if I didn't point out the fact that the way that trans um, and gender nonconforming bodies have been represented in the media as people who are deceiving or deceptive is actually this um, incredibly violent trope that was uh, that has been around um, in American media for quite some time. So starting in about the late 40s, um, it really became part of pulp media in the 60s and 70s um, and remained almost a staple in um, popular culture and, and in the imag uh, American imaginary for quite some time. So if you think about the late 90s and early 2000s and these sort of um, sort of super uh, salacious talk shows like Maury and, you know, the Ricky, I don't even remember her name. Um, <laughs> uh, those, those types of shows, right? Um, these ideas of revealing and deception around gender nonconforming folks and um, trans women in particular were really, really violent, but also very popular narratives. And so I wanna make sure that we're placing this in a larger trajectory about the way that mainstream media um, addresses and ultimately commits violence against gender nonconforming and trans folks through media representations and understanding that this is not new, right? Uh, patriarchy is not new. Heteropatriarchy is not new. And these colonial conceptions of gender are certainly not new. And that this is part of a much longer story that, um, that we tell and actually is deeply rooted in the medicalizing and pathologizing of gender nonconforming people and trans bodies. Um, so that's kind of the the most the talking I'm going to do about that. But if you have questions about those media portrayals or the way that we came up things with like the Harry Benjamin um, protocol of uh, of care, uh, which has a lot to do with um, the medical establishment and again the medicalizing of trans identities. Uh, I'm more than happy to talk about that um, at length and I can either do that in a later session or you're welcome to ask me questions about that but I just want you to understand, I really can't hammer this in enough, that I was really troubled by the way that Delores is talking about deception and revealing and invention in her article as well as the level of violence um, that is enacted towards uh, gender nonconforming people, right, in this, uh, in this film. So I want us to be really mindful of that. And if you're going to write about that, I want you to be really careful with that language um, because we can do a lot of violence through our language and I don't want you to revisit that violence.
um, in part because the, the theoretical piece that you were given had some troubling language in it. So I just want to point that out. Um, but I also want to point out sort of the two major things that you need to focus on in this writing, which is this idea of the fantasy and the role that fantasy plays in the imagination. Now you'll remember we've had some articles, it's the Apodurai article, that talks about the importance of social imagination and imagination as being a social project and one that is socially constructed. So remember Apodurai is saying the, the ideas we have about other places are not coincidental, but rather deeply informed and deeply shaped by our socio-political context. So being um, uh, an American citizen in the first world, for instance, though I may also be queer and brown, right? Um, that deeply informs the, the way that I, um, the constructions I had of things like Asia, right? And so Purnima is going to talk at length about this idea of Orientalism and the way that we talk about um, East versus West and those characterizations and the legacy of colonialism behind those. And she'll be drawing heavily, I imagine, from Edward Said, who coined the term in 78, um, in his 1978 publication, Orientalism. So keep an eye out for that and make sure that if you didn't quite understand what was happening with this um, discussion of Asian women and Orientalism in these pieces, that hopefully moving forward, Purnima's lecture will clarify that for you. Uh, which is to say these ideas that we have about Asian women in particular as being docile, right? This characterization and this um, racist stereotype is coming from a very particular place. And it's one that we talked about before in some of our sections uh, when we were talking about Babel. Like, why is it that um, Chaco is the one who ends up actually being silent because she is both deaf and mute? And while it's valuable to have representations of disability in the media, what does it mean that this disability was assigned to an Asian woman? And that is that may also be the way that we think about Asian women. And M. Butterfly is really pushing against that. So again, make sure you're attentive to this idea of imagination and fantasy in the Della Redis reading, um, and this construction that we have specifically of Asian femininity. That's going to be really important. On the other hand, there are some sections that you can kind of back burner. And if you were confused by them or you didn't quite get what was being said there, don't worry about it. And those two sections are the way that she's talking about the fetish throughout the piece. Glean what you can from that, but don't worry if you didn't get the specifics of it. And all of her references to Freud in which she really delves into the psychoanalytic theory. That's a much larger conversation. Freud is a very fraught and controversial figure. Again, like I said, very sort of wed to this idea of the gender binary. And so um, his work has been taken up and, and uh, dismantled and deconstructed over and over by uh, queer theorists and, and um, other folks that are deeply invested in, in social commentary and, and as well as other folks um, in psychoanalytic theory. So if you were troubled by anything that was um, in these massive sections about Freud, we're going to encourage you, don't worry about it. Again, focus on the role of fantasy, focus specifically on the way that racialized femininity is being discussed in this piece. 